Thanks, Jay. Uh, I'm really pleased to be back here again at DevOps Days New York. Uh, I was here last year. It was an absolutely great experience. And I'm glad to give you a, for the most part, pretty much brand new talk. This has only been shopped out at a meetup before. So buckle up. Let's have a lot of fun. And again, my name is uh, Matt. I'm a DevOps advocate and thought validator at PagerDuty. And I would tell you to go visit the booth, but the booths are all shut down now, so whatever. But I hope you went and had fun. Anyway, great. So I want you all to imagine a world where you understand what you're working on. You're clear on what your dependencies are, who relies on you, and what you're delivering. You have this clear vision of your impact on your business, your organization, and you know what you want to do to continue delivering value to those people that you care about. You innovate, you try new things, and you can solve problems effectively when they come up. You and your colleagues work together to bring value to your business without blame, and you can make changes without being afraid of unintended consequences. Sounds dope, right? All right, let's see how we can get there. So here's the thing, we talk about this idea of service ownership, and this means that people take responsibility for what they deliver at every stage of a service's lifetime. And embracing service ownership is a way to get to that vision I talked about on the last slide. But let's get started with a word here. What the hell is a service anyway, right? We could talk about this for an open space for 30 minutes about every different definition of a service. I could ask 10 engineers what a service is and I'll get 15 different definitions, right? And it can be a lot of different things, right? Maybe a service is a microservice. That's probably where your head went first because I mean, it's DevOps days, so microservice all the things, right? But it could also be referred to a slice of a monolith. It would be an internal tool. Maybe we're thinking about a piece of functionality. Maybe we're thinking about a component or a shared infrastructure or even a feature. These are all things that could be a way we think about a service. And here's what it boils down to. If it provides value to other people, that's a service. So the first thing is you need to understand what it means to you. There's no one right answer. The wrong answer is when you disagree with the rest of your organization about what a service is. So I'll give you an example. This is how we think about a service at PagerDuty. So our definition is kind of specific to some form of infrastructure that might be composed of multiple distinct services that might be written as separate pieces of code, right? The thing is, it's wholly owned by a team. I like to think about a service as a boundary of responsibility. And... It's important to have this shared understanding of those boundaries and figure out who the stakeholders of that service are. If there are multiple teams contributing, maintaining, and supporting a given service, this shared understanding becomes even more important. So you can start by considering who is responsible for this service that we're defining. So a service should be wholly owned by the team that is on call for it. Again, that's where I think about a service definition as a boundary of responsibility. If multiple teams share responsibility for a service, sometimes it's better to uh, administratively, if you will, split that service up into separate ones. Some organizations call this service mitosis, may making a rule that at a certain team size or a certain volume of code, the service and team must be split up. And yes, lines of code is a crap metric. But, you know, if you use it, don't feel too bad about yourself. There's worse things you can do. Uh, services should be set up granularly enough to help identify where problems are coming from. So the thing is, if two microservices always basically behave as one area, and fixing a problem in one generally means fixing it somewhere else, then, yeah, don't get pedantic and say, well, technically, these are two microservices, so they should be defined separately. No, they're really one bit of business functionality as far as a boundary responsibility goes. So what about the monolith, our friend the monolith? Also, thanks to Aaron for correcting this slide. I had uh, Stonehenge up before, and he reminded me that's not a monolith, that's something else. So pedantry is a thing, right? So the thing is, if you have a monolith, first of all, don't feel bad. It's cool. Um, but think about how you're going to address on-call responsibilities for it. Monoliths tend to be involved in a lot of incidents just because they're big and they span a lot of stuff. So it's okay. And sometimes they're actionable and sometimes they're not. So if one team owns the whole monolith, they usually don't own any other services unless somehow the on-call of the monolith is low. But 
if multiple teams share responsibility for this monolith, think about how you can carve up those areas of responsibility based on functionality, and then route the alerts related to the, that functionality to those teams who have the ownership, right? Each source of functionality can be represented as a different service in your documentation, enumerated in your runbooks and wikis, along with your on-call ownership in something like PagerDuty. So the thing is, service ownership really is a shared responsibility. It's not just the software engineers who sling the code who are accountable to the ownership of what that service does. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to step through some of those different roles in this shared responsibility. And as I talk about a role that you might identify with, you might find yourself sitting there going, Matty, I already know that shit. You know what? That's cool. Listen to the other parts. Because that's what's really interesting, right? I want you to think about the roles of the other folks who are involved in service ownership. And hey, maybe you'll learn something about your own role too. That'd be cool. So let's think about folks who, who identify as devs, as Christine said yesterday, right? So developing a service as a software engineer is more than just writing the code. Yes, of course, it involves the code, right? In the, some type of shared repo. Hopefully you got some docs you know, and whatever contract that service provides uh, that other services might need to understand. Thing is, all these pieces as you're developing a service, you may not know the answers to all this stuff as you're initially designing and creating it, but you want to have some kind of standard process that your organization has agreed upon. It's similar to what Yana talked about yesterday with uh, the review, the production readiness, right? So it's the same thing. You want a common way you do this, right? And the thing is, you're not the only person who's going to interact with this service, uh, unless it's my code um, that sits in a repo that nobody ever looks at, nobody ever runs my applications. But hopefully you don't have that problem. So you want to make sure that that code is reviewed with other members of your team by whatever process is appropriate for you. And because you're not always going to be around to answer questions about this stuff that you created. So you, it is incumbent upon you to make it understandable enough so you're not the single point of contact. And this takes being deliberate and thinking about, and again, the person you're helping might be future you, so maybe you want to be selfish at school. I like to say the two hardest things in computer science are caching strategies and naming. There's also an off by one joke in here somewhere. Um, and that's not necessarily wrong, right? So it's totally common to use clever and fun and silly names whether they're Greek mythical figures, inside jokes, pop culture references, species of Pokemon, you know, as placeholders for your service names. And when you have a small organization, you think that everyone's always going to remember all these inside jokes and references, but your organization's going to grow, right? The team's going to grow. You're going to bring in new people, and eventually the memories of that inside joke are going to fade, and now you have to explain it over and over again to everybody. And to be honest, at that point, if you have to explain the joke, it probably wasn't that funny in the first place. So, you know, to kind of paraphrase Seinfeld, I'm also offended as a comedian uh, at your bad service names. But so here's the thing. So you want to be specific, right? And this is boring. I get it. It's not fun. But name the service based on what it actually does. And if you already have services with these less than specific names, don't panic. You don't have to fix everything right away. This takes some time. So think about fixing forward, right, and starting to name the new things and then, you know, embracing kind of that, uh, that pattern of letting the other stuff fall off, right? You want to default to longish names instead of these really short ones. But here's the thing. You go too long, you know what people do with long names? They turn them into acronyms. And now you have the same problem you had with your inside joke, and now you got to explain that acronym and what it really means. We always think that acronyms save us time, but they actually just add cognitive overload, and they just generally suck. All right, uh, that's a technical term. So, like, these are names that are specific, and yeah, I understand. They're not very clever, but they say what they do. You could look at the service, and you could probably reason about what the hell it's supposed to actually do. These are names that are less amazing. Like, don't name it Pac-Man. Uh, Bergen DB is not clever, so just get over it, right? I have a colleague who's worked at four different organizations with a service named Artemis. This is probably not the last place she's worked at that will have it. She will see it again. So, then it doesn't tell you anything about it, right? We want to think about how we describe the service beyond just its name. So, what is the intent of this service? Where, this is where you can record its purpose, its raison d'etre. Why does it exist, right? 
more importantly, how does it deliver value? That kind of matters, you know? Um, what does it contribute to? Is it part of a customer-facing feature? Explain how it impacts customers. And the description can also mention the other components that it may interact with, but know that those change as the service owners make changes to those components. Dependencies are kind of a thing. I'm not gonna dig too much into this, but when you think about your service may present itself as an API of some sort, and thinking about versioning that provides a lot of value for the people who are consuming it. Uh, I always go back to this, this, uh, this thought where, where when we would, we would make changes to a service, and this was pre-microservice days, back in, in good old soap. And my CTO was like, well, we have to check, we have to test, every single time we test one of these things, we have to test all of the functionality through everything, all the way back to the data warehouse. And I said, I said to her, I said, boss, when Google updates their Maps API, do they reach out to every single one of their customers and ask them to check it? No, that it's version, right, so that you can work to that. So thinking whether it's through Semver or API versioning, those things matter. All right, so let's think another role. So this is maybe your sustainability team, right, which this is a kind of a broad strokes. This might be, you might call them SREs, you might not, because you might argue with me about whether or not SREs are sustainability teams, call them what you want. Maybe it's ops, whatever it is. These are folks that are kind of helping thinking about the, the care and feeding, if you will. So run books are a thing, right? Things are gonna go wrong. And as we, over time, we you know, learn about the different nuances of our service, we wanna keep a record of what we've tried that can help resolve these common issues. So in an ideal world, we'll know all these things and it's all the known knowns, and if Ospa was here, he'd be yelling at me like crazy right now when I just said you could predict anything. Because you know what, you can't. And this is the problem with run books. You need to be able to ensure that you are updating them regularly. Because when you make changes to your service, the things you do yesterday are different. If you don't have the ability to keep your run books up to date, you should consider abandoning that run book altogether. Because an out of date run book is considered harmful. It can cause more harm than good. Uh, work at PagerDuty, you might care a little bit about alerting. So here's the deal, right? You wanna only alert on things that are actionable. This is how you keep people from getting burned out. There's nothing more annoying than getting that PagerDuty alert at 3.30 in the morning about something you can't do shit about, right? That's not helpful. And that also leads us to normalization of deviance where we start ignoring alerts. So I'm gonna dig a little bit more into how that alerting works uh, in a couple slides. And you might think that your sustainability group is there to help ensure resiliency of your service. Well, how many people were here for the Ignites yesterday? Right, how many people know that John disagrees with us and he's not wrong? The things we think about from a sustainability perspective are not about resiliency. We might think more about robustness and reliability, but these are things when we think about high availability, you know, uh, disaster recovery, the things that are the things we can predict that we know this is a thing that could happen. We were talking about robustness and reliability, and your sustainability groups are really good at this. I used to say that good sysadmins are all cynics because our job is to think of everything that might possibly go wrong. Um, we think about program management. Hey, well, we just had like a pretty, you know, awesome kind of thinking about this, so I'm not gonna go too, too deep. As normally, I'd have to go back and explain it all, but I had a great lead-in, so, right? Uh, but the thing is, there's an element of unpredictability in service ownership, right? And so when you think about the outcomes that come from our post-incident reviews or our post-mortems, proactive maintenance. So program management can help um, think about being mindful of the buffer that we need for that kind of additional work. And, you know, maybe you call this project management. It's okay, you don't have to feel bad about yourself. It's all right, I'm not judging. But, and not every organization, as we know, has, has program management. But these are some of the things they can think about. They're helpful to understand what done means understanding things about the, having emotional awareness on the stress of the team from other uh, factors, and thinking about that connective tissue between different teams and features, and what does it mean to pull people away from other initiatives. And then when we think about product, these things are pretty closely aligned. So the thing is, product owners are thinking about translating the requirements of customers beyond what something looks like and is capable of, right? Customers will tell product owners about what they want a product to do, but they're rarely, they're rarely going to specifically ask for things around uptime, performance, or security in an interview or user forum. And by that, I mean they're not going to use those words, but they want it and they're going to ask for it, right? Because without uptime, a customer can't get to that new wonderful feature that you've delivered. Without performance, they're going to leave in frustration. Uh, our CEO likes to say that slow is the new down. 
right? Performance matters. And without security, they sure as hell aren't going to trust that new feature. And speaking of CEOs, senior leadership actually has a pretty important part to play in service ownership. And this model works best when it's championed by your top leadership and is consistent across product and engineering, right? So leaders, they help set goals to balance business priorities. They have to make room in their roadmaps for investing in tech debt and kind of driving a culture of cooperation and sharing. So let's go a little bit into some of the specific things, right? So this service that we're building and developing and iterating on, what are we observing about it? What are we noticing about it? What are we paying attention to? So, and usually at this point, I like to kind of talk about observability versus monitoring. We talk about both of those things. Um, and that itself is a whole talk in itself. And you know what? You kind of saw it yesterday. So I'm not going to go too deep, but here's a really great analogy um, from, from Liz about the difference between observability and monitoring. And by the way, you need both of these things. But as Liz says, monitoring is when your bank tells you that you're overdrawn. Observability lets you know you're running out of money because you're spending too much money on chocolate and sweets and candy because you recorded data on what you've spent all your money on. This felt it hit a little too home for me, personally. Um, and along those lines, I like to think about this idea of empathy-driven alerting. You want to focus on the customer experience. What are the key business metrics around the experience of your customers? And if this part of the talk isn't enough honeycomb fanboying for you, here's the third <laughs> reference I'm going to make, which is Charity Majors, who loves to say, nines don't matter if your customers aren't happy. And Again, I could, we could have an entire talk about SLOs and SLAs and SLIs. In fact, there was one last year here at DevOps Days New York from Alex. But I'm going to make a quick reference because I want to make a point. So these are the different. If you're not familiar, an SLI is a service level indicator. These are specific things that we are measuring. When they may be things like latency or throughput, they are not goals, but they are what are the measure? What does the dial look like that we're defining? And then we talk about a service level objective, and these are made up of SLIs, they're measured over time, and they're, these are not contractually set. These are objectives. These are the ones that are contractually set. These are the ones that when you break them, you owe your customer money, right? So where do you think we want to alert? I like to say, first of all, you want to alert on your SLOs, not your SLAs, because you don't want to be alerted when you break an SLA, because it's a little too late at that point. So you want to alert and think about where to set your SLOs. And this is something that I accidentally came up with as a term with Dr. Jennifer Petoff, who's the editor of the SRE book, and we call it the Hadness Point. And this is the inflection between customer happiness and customer sadness where they directly meet. And this is where you set your SLO. Because if you set it too tight, you're going to be alerted when your customers are still happy and you've wasted a little bit of time. If you set it a little too loose, You've got sad customers by the time you're being alerted. So you want to find this hadness point. And this is a technical term, and it will be in a book by O'Reilly, maybe. Well, probably not. But um, speaking of, Alex from last year, he's got a book about SLOs, an O'Reilly book coming. So again, you want to alert on the SLOs. This is when you have PagerDuty wake you up, when you're hitting an SLO. And think a little bit about how do you want a team to respond to this service, to issues with this service, right? You want to think about, as you're, as, as you're observing this information, how do we continue to tune it? And look for patterns. Are we seeing consistency? And this is where your post-incident reports become really key to say, are we seeing similar patterns in consumption of this service and incidents related to it? Always be happy to prune your alerts, right? If you alert on five things and you understand all, all five of those things equally, that's pretty fair. If you alert on a thousand things and you treat each of those with equal priority, it's unlikely that any of them are getting the priority that they truly need. So always, always, and this is why you do postmortems and PIRs, even on things that turned out to not be incidents because they're an opportunity to tune your alerting. You want to suppress non-actionable alerts, right? Uh, work with your alerting tool to think about ways that you can suppress these non-actionable alerts. I hear PagerDuty has a feature that does this. I'm just saying, right? Maybe. I'd say go check it out at the booth, but you can't. Uh, anyway, think about the business impact. Do you know how your company makes money? If you don't, go find out. We'll wait, right? How does this service tie to your customers and to your revenue and to the things you need to deliver? Do you understand the business metrics connected to this service? 
And to kind of wrap this up, we're going to review the stages of the life cycle that a service might go through and where all those things we just talked about fit into that, right? So when we think about designing a new service, this is the fun part, right? This is that green field, white piece of paper, starting from scratch, right? So the couple of things to think about. You need to understand your customers. The product is great for this. Your product team is great for this. Making sure that your sustainability teams are involved as early as possible because they're thinking about things that you might not be thinking about in this great green, bright sky, blue sky world. You want to start thinking about what those SLOs and SLIs are as early as possible because that helps you tie them not to the tech. And now we think when we're maintaining and iterating, now we're moving. This is where we spend most of our life, right? Continuing, because services are never done. So we talked about versioning the API. This is really key, and this is where it matters because you want to be able to move forward without breaking your customers. And you need to be able to communicate to them and have a method and a methodology on which you share these changes, right? Continually address tech debt. I mean, Dave gave us a great Ignite about that this morning, so that's awesome. Was it no, this morning? I don't remember when you do Ignites here. Um, and then, but the thing is, eventually, all good things come to an end. And when we retire a service, uh, we talk first about deprecating that service and then sunsetting. And deprecating is usually when we say it's still around, we're not fixing it anymore, we're not, we're not iterating, we're not improving it, but we don't want to just pull the plug on it right away and leave our customers in the dust. So we might deprecate first. So to, but in order to go through this, we need to be able to identify the consumers of this service. And this is where your customer success and your support teams can actually help you with this a lot. They might know folks that are paying money for this service you want to get rid of. So you want to figure out what the business impact of doing that is. How is that going to impact some of your customers? And you want to be able to communicate and offboard them. And the most important thing is give them an alternative. Give them a migration path. Don't just say, okay, we're turning this thing off in two weeks, so hope you don't mind. That doesn't go super duper well. I might think of some products that do that. The thing is, at the end of the day, service ownership includes communication, compromise, and commitment. So this idea, it's not just about your technology, it's not just about writing cool alerts and pager duty and writing awesome postmortems and things like that. It's all about this collaboration across all of these multiple roles. And this is where the, the stuff really matters. Uh, some acknowledgements I'd like to provide. So Lilia Gutnick at Pager Duty helped write a lot of this content. Uh, hat tip to Charity and Liz. Um, uh, images came from Pixabay if you enjoyed this talk. You know, here's some other things you may find interesting. I run a podcast called Arrested DevOps. I organize DevOps Day Chicago. Our CFP is open. Submit some talks. Uh, you can find me on the Twitters. This deck, I'll post the link in Slack as well. But the slides are up on my speaking page. And yeah, that's my license plate. Um, <laughs> Quick couple pager duty plugs. One is we're doing an event here in New York in a couple weeks. Uh, this is a practitioner oriented event. It's not slide decks and sales. We're doing a workshop on postmortems, a bunch of other stuff. Come check that out. It's free. Should be a lot of fun. And hey, if you want to do the job that I do and be a DevOps advocate, go to pduty.me slash work with pagey. We have an opening on the team. And we're also hiring for other stuff at pagerduty.com slash careers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matt.